Welcome, guys, back to the Grateful Living Podcast. Today, I'm thankful to have Christine and John Gregoric. Uh, in March of uh, 2019, Christine and John's son, Patrick, uh, unfortunately passed away by suicide. Um, you know, I've said this in, you know, I've referenced this, referenced this in some of my videos um, in terms of when people have asked uh you know, why and how Grateful Living was started. And I've, I've, I've talked about losing a friend um, to suicide in March of 2019 and making a commitment uh, within the year to take action. Uh, I haven't publicly stated his name or talked about him, um, but Patrick, uh, Pat is, is the individual I'm referring to. Um, so with that being said, you know, I just want to acknowledge him uh, everything that I do and have done with Grateful Living is done with Pat's spirit. Um, and I, I thank him for that, for, for guiding us in a lot of great conversations, uh, a lot of destigmatizing de de efforts. Um, I know a lot of people have thanked me uh, for what I've done, but I hope people realize um, before you can thank me, uh, you need to thank Pat um, for his, you know, his his mark and his impact on my life. And, uh, you know, before we get started, I just want to thank Christine and John, you know, for for talking about this. This is not the easiest thing to talk about publicly. Uh, and I, I appreciate their openness to, to speak about their journey. And, um, you know, I just want to say to you guys, you know, I this might get emotional at times. And if you guys need a break, just let me know. And if I ask something you don't want to answer, just say so. Um, you know, this, this is, you know, I think a, a mixture of a celebration of life to celebrate, you know, Pat's life um, for those, you know, all of us that knew him and for those that didn't to get, you know, uh, some idea of his spirit and maybe take that with you in your life. And then also to just um, you know, continue to have these conversations to destigmatize and uh, to create more openness uh, to prevent others, uh, you know, from uh, not getting help or or things of that nature. So, uh, with all that being said, Christine and John, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for inviting us. I appreciate it. Uh, so, you know. Maybe just set the scene, uh, you know, for for your, you know, your family, uh, you know, uh, talk about, uh, you know, how many children you have, uh, what order Patrick falls in and, you know, um, describe Pat, you know, as a, as a kid. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, we, well, we have um, three children, um, four counting our daughter-in-law, Amy. Um, my daughter Rachel is um, she's 34. She um, she works at Harvard. She works um, uh, coordinating services for students that have disabilities. Um, and then my son Johnny is um, a professional runner and also studying law at Suffolk Law School. Um, his wife Amy is a teacher at Northeastern. And um, yes, Patrick. Um, <laughs> so Patrick, was, there was 10 years separated from Rachel and Patrick. Um, Rachel was very much like a second mother to him. Um, and the only way to describe him was he was the love of our lives. He was just from a baby, just like the personality that you knew him at Boston College, you know, when he was 21, was it, it was there when he was an infant, a toddler. He had, he had a belly laugh at three months. It was strange. Like you didn't see an infant laugh the way he would laugh. And, and Everyone in our town of Seekonk, um, we're a population of about 13,000 people. Um, everyone described him the same way. Um, all of his teachers, um, he left an impact on them. Um, he was a very, very unique individual. And, and I say that, and it must sound strange, well, every mother is, <laughs> of course, proud of their children and you know thinks that they're special. He was um, just beyond special, just on. Um, just a beautiful, compassionate person, even from such a young age. I have no memory ever, ever of him ever fighting with another child, like 
well, all children do that on a school playground or whatever. Never once. It was not in his makeup. He was just uh, um, just a very sweet, endearing, um, a wonderful son to us. Just so loving to us. Um, cared sometimes way too much, worried too much about us um, and others. He took on the problems of a lot of people. Um, and I think a lot of people um, with mental health, it, it, it's kind of the irony of, of the disease. It's a beautiful side to them because of the disease, perhaps, as crazy as that can sound. Patrick was an incredibly compassionate person. And he was very, he didn't, and he had, he had uh, great empathy, empathy for other people. Um, and maybe if, if, it's, if it's possible, maybe to a fault, he very much felt pain that other people felt. He, he felt good times when people were joyful. Um, and very often he would listen, he, would, he was more than happy to listen as long as anybody needed to talk and pour out their heart to him. And he took on a lot of that. He actually absorbed a lot of it. Um, some of it's in hindsight now knowing that, um, but because he didn't, then he also, <laughs> he was humble about that because we didn't, you know, we knew the type of person he was, but we had no idea of how many other people uh, at college, mostly we, you know, the people in town, we knew his friends here, but the outpouring since Patrick died is incredible. I mean, if you're, you're an example um, to, to, to know the different people that knew him, he, but it, um, yeah, a beautiful soul, didn't have a competitive bone in his body, um, did not, that wasn't his thing. His, his, his was, he was a big, loved to hug. We, we, we joked that COVID would have been terrible for Patrick because he, he's a hugger and he would not have liked not to hug people. Um, yeah, just a beautiful, passionate soul. And, you know, we have, we're so grateful to God that he had, he gave him to us to be his parents for 20, 22 years. We honestly shake our heads like, why would we give him Patrick? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you talked about it, um, a little bit there, but, um, as he, you know, grows to be a young adult, do you, do you like what, I guess, was there a point at which you saw him dealing with certain mental health issues or, you know, um, things of that nature and, you know, how was that? Well, um, it started um, a little bit more noticeably in high school. He, he was struggling. He was starting to get nervous, I think, about his future in college and going away. And um, so there, was some, there were some signs uh, you know, in, in the latter part of his high school years when things, I think when a lot of people, a lot of young people <laughs> start mm -hmm. to, you know, start to think about these things and what the future is going to hold. Um, and so there were some times when he was very anxious, um, you know, obviously verbal with us about it um, and just how much he, he struggled with anxiety. Um, and yeah. Yeah, and I, I would even go back maybe into middle school. I think, you know, we could look back and see that there were quite a few times there. But um, to his credit, he himself, you know, came to us to take help. And so we um, obviously had him see his pediatrician and um, he started seeing a psychologist. Um, and his pediatrician recommended sertraline. So he was on a 50 milligrams of sertraline along with seeing a psychologist on a weekly basis. Um, whether that helped, um, you know, it's difficult for us as parents to look back and say, you know, was there this diagnosis? Was there this diagnosis? Was there bipolar? Um, I think that's something that I, I've not been able to help myself, but, but research a little bit and then see, oh gosh, lots of, lots of symptoms that he would have displayed. And I always thought of bipolar as someone that just had these manic episodes and did something crazy. And, and then I'd learned that's not at all the situation that someone can be bipolar with. Um, in, in a much less recognizable way. Um, 
And I, again, I, you know, there, there are several things that, you know, we can talk about um, during this time, but um, just, just some of those small little things like um, even going to the doctor and the doctor asking practical the questions where I look back and think, I think the caretakers need to be asked the questions. I think they need to be asked, what are you observing? Because I think that the patient um, can be very fearful in answering the question that what, what are the repercussions if I tell you what I'm really thinking? What, what could happen to me? Am I gonna end up in a, you know, a, a mental hospital where, you know, how is that gonna affect my life as a young you know, teenager that just wants to be a normal kid? And so I think some of those things, you know, I think helpful for um, you know, the sake to families to, and, and to doctors. Um, and as psychologists, that we should have been much more heavily involved in those, those meetings. That, that's a great point, especially because the person in that situation probably doesn't always have the best self awareness either of right. understanding themselves. Yeah. Right. And he, he, you know, also in, in line with a lot of it, and I think it's very common, he, uh, he struggled with like taking the medication and not having it affect him, not, not, thinking it's it's going to make him somebody different than who he is. And I think you knew Patrick, so you knew how being authentic was very, very important yep. as, as, as it should be. Um, and he felt um, at times that it, it might be taking away from him being who he really was. And, and even again, to the detriment, I think he, sometimes he, he, um, uh, he, he wanted to feel certain things he didn't want it to numb him let's just put it he didn't want that to numb him he wanted to feel life and have emotions and things like that um but again it, it was to a uh to a to a fault really um but he uh yeah he, I, I think that but i i'm i'm thinking that's kind of common with people that have to maybe take take a uh some kind of anti-anxiety or depression medicine that you go you struggle with that whole part of how much am I masking or it's yeah it's just um it's okay to to need to need medication yeah no you guys mentioned it earlier too about his selflessness you know when I you know was preparing for this I read a lot of the Facebook posts uh that people have written about him and and there's a common theme of you know Patrick being there for them in their dark times. There's many, many, like several posts that say like that exact line of um, Patrick was there for me in my dark times. And, you know, it, it's an interesting uh, thing, you know, with uh, the three people that I've lost uh, to suicide, some of the most empathetic and selfless people um, and, and just, uh, you know, were, unable to do that for themselves, you know, always there for others. And I think Pat fits right into that description of always being there for others. Yeah. And, you know, he didn't, uh, you know, and he didn't share a lot of that with us, you know, he didn't share a lot of, um, again, I think out of fear, I, I don't, he didn't want us to, he, a couple of things. I, I, we believe that he didn't want us to, to worry about him. Um, and, and, in fear for him. And then at the same time, I think he also, um, yeah, I guess I just he didn't, maybe, maybe he was worried about like our reaction to it in some way, shape or form. Um, that might not be, that, that made him, that uh, made him afraid, I guess. Hmm. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess, um, not to go right into it, but, you know, maybe uh, was there a point at which it became more serious before his senior year of college? Or uh, if not, you know, maybe just talk about senior year of college um, and what that year was like for him. Patrick had a rough ride at, at college, not in terms of his friends or, or in his class of professors, but in terms of, again, these, these anxiety issues. As you, so Patrick, just for those who don't know, he um, started out freshman year, um, and he, you know, it, it, yeah, like every freshman, he was he was anxious and stuff, and he lived on that upper campus, and you know, he did fine. He, he 
um, his roommates and things like that. It started to get, you know, anytime, anytime it was exam time, get that stress level would go up for sure. Right. Any the pressure level would go up. Typical like college time. Um, there was a time when I think it was his uh, the end of his freshman year exam. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, I thought that was I to pick him up at that freshman form. But anyway, oh, no. we actually had to. He was in such a state of like anxiety that we he he uh, right the night before one of his exams he just couldn't couldn't set himself down. So we drove up again. Fortunately, we're an hour away, and we actually spent the we went we actually had to go to a hotel with him. We spent the night not to get him to at least be able to, to some sleep, and then he did. He went on to do fine in the exam. But it was just uh, there were times throughout his his um his time at, at boston college that was just very difficult he would just have anxiety attacks that were beyond like he would just call us and need to need to get out of that situation um in in a very short time period and fortunately we could do that i mean to be honest with you yeah some of it is difficult to share but he would um i would i would, I would have pick him up and I would pick him up and he would hold my no, right, we're talking to a 20 year old boy. Young yep. Man. Yep. He would hold he would grab my hand and hold my hand on the way home and rub my hand. I think he, he told us that he, he was so frightened he said he thought I was gonna die. Panic attacks were so bad. Yeah. So I have those the beautiful they're, they're, now, now, uh, they're beautiful memories actually that but I was you know when you think back on it and at the time I'm not gonna lie that I was I was sort of I was a little bit concerned. I was a little bit, I'm um, honestly saying, well, okay, this is odd, a 20 year old uh, grabbing his dad's hand. And, and it, it was more, it was very effect, very like, oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness you, you, you saved me. And I felt yeah. good about that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so it was kind of, you know, so there were some episodes like that. Um, and then he just. Uh, but I guess taking that yeah. back to what I was saying earlier, I think in a setting with the doctor, his understanding, he would say that this is, this is at a different level. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know that. And of course, I wanted to believe that it wasn't that serious. I was as guilty as anybody of wanting to say, this is okay. Okay, he suffers from anxiety and, and um, you know, maybe, but they never even used depression. They always just said anxiety. And looking back, it was certainly very, three months prior, very total different personality in terms of you know, symptoms of depression. But we, we never had those settings where we were describing the, what we just described to you that was happening. This was at a level where, you know, he probably shouldn't have been at Boston College. He probably should have assisted, you know, home and been cared for. And it's, I mean, environment, as you know, at Boston College, it's yeah. a very stressful environment, very competitive. And he was a very good student and took his courses so seriously. Yeah, he, um, you know, going specifically going then back to that sophomore year, going back, he only, I dropped him off and he really just, he was going to be living at the, um, what, you know, the house where. Loyola house. Yes, yes. So, but he really, it just was a struggle. And, and uh, I literally went back within 24 hours, and, but maybe that, maybe thought it was something that he could just get over very it's just again not it's just not a very common thing so i thought maybe it was something he could just get through right through them we he insisted on we came home and then very courageously he decided he wanted to commute continue to school and commute and uh, and it was incredible because it, it took a lot a lot to do for him to do that he commuted in classes we've heard some incredible stories over that people he met while commuting it's into school um, but it, again, another another rough another rough beginning of a year, and um, and then he just struggled with finding good the housing situation. Just wasn't great sophomore year. So it, the, the Patrick's it was like a bumpy ride that way. It was bumpy, <clears throat> you know. He 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 felt, uh, and you get to correct me. He, he it, a lot of times he he felt like he didn't fit in, which was so. Then and then to hear the outpouring afterwards is absolutely amazing because that was clearly his perception and mm. not reality. Yeah. You know, he, because he, he, he often gave, we often had the impression 
that he, one of the things that troubled him was not fitting in to whether, I mean, Boston College in general or a group of friends. And, and it was actually, that was actually not a realistic, that wasn't re reality. Um, yeah. We came to found out, we came to find out <clears throat> after from yeah. how many people he, how many friends he did have and how many people did care for him and how many, you know, so that, you know, I, I don't know, you know, how we would have, could have known anything, but it, it just, you know, kind of like, it was kind of up and down with that with that with Patrick his, his whole time at, at Boston College. It, there were some times that were better than ever, better than others. I mean, certainly, otherwise he would have made it. Yeah. Uh, but there were other times that were very, very uh, anxious, anxious times for all, for, for all the three of us and us as parents. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, again, I'm not a psychologist by any means, but, you know, in, in terms of the, you know, for people out there listening about panic attacks and, things like that. Like if you see um, a friend dealing with that, I would definitely encourage you to encourage them to get, uh, if they're not getting any professional help or, or things of that nature, because as you talked about it, John, it's a, it's a, it's a fight or flight state and they're not in a, a rational state. And, you know, it's, you know, uh, at that time, you know, you're looking for any level of support. Um, and so I, I think that's a, a really big key. Um, and, I, and I think the what you talked about in terms of, you know, we, we talked about this pre-recording, um, but like I, I've been open with my audience about dealing with depression and anxiety since I was 13. One of the reasons I never had um, a conversation with with Pat on on these topics was a I, I didn't at that time know how to you know really talk about it um, you know in terms of it, you know, it just felt like you know you were soft if you talked about your feelings or things like that like men didn't talk about that and um, but the second reason was really like even though we would have those discussions of him being anxious about, you know, uh, asking someone on a date or whatever. It, it was, for me, like, I, I looked at him like as, and I think a lot of people did is like, he had everything together, you know, and so I never, and, and it's, it's very interesting that you say, he never felt like he fit in. Because if, if as you said, if you asked anybody in the liturgy arts group, you know, his sophomore or freshman year, um, they, you know, he was one of the most well-liked people, like all the junior girls loved him and things like that. Like, and all of us as junior guys loved him. Like, you know, it, so it's, it's very interesting um, having those observations as a third party person versus how the individual is perceiving it. And, you know, I think that, kind of leads to a cycle of continuing to have that storyline in your head um, of feeling like you're not fitting in and just, you know, creating that in your mind um, where, you know, for anybody out there, like if, if you see a friend kind of creating that storyline, maybe just stop them immediately, you know, um, in, in hindsight, if I had, you know, obviously known the things that I knew, um, I would have told Pat, you know, you're one of the most popular, one of the most well-liked people here, like, you know, and it, it's just, um, it's just, a, it's just a shame that, um, well, the internal yeah. voices are different. Yeah, exactly. Than reality. Uh, exactly. And when I say, when I say he, um, he never felt like that, like that was that's sort of hyperbole. I, he worried that he didn't fit in. Like, like yeah. I think it's, that's maybe a little more accurate that that yeah. he you no, know, because obviously he he and especially uh, honestly the lag group especially oh my gosh he 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 definitely voiced to us how much you got that that group and um uh and meant it meant to him sons of St Patrick yep. Uh, yep. If, if, you know sons of St Patrick they, 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 so so I think just the, the worry of you know the worry of Am I fitting in? And then, and then most, and then a lot of days, no, it's all good, everything's fine. But then, always kind of coming back to that, always maybe maybe going back to that, 
in a in an unhealthy way, like, you know, maybe I'm not fitting in. I don't know if I you know what I mean? When like you said, you were quite different and when and and we did too, but with those it was just except saying so the things that he would voice would um would be worrying about yeah, worrying about whether someone's gonna like him or yeah. Yeah. Um, some of those are just like the symptoms. I think it, the, the core is the illness that why he wasn't able to be able to, even if you said those things to him or not, I'm not sure that it would have resonated or been able to because of the barriers that the brain wasn't allowed. 100%. Yeah. Because of the illness. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and, and what one, one thing I have, um, I wouldn't call it a pet peeve, but I'm not sure how else to phrase it is that I never, ever think that Patrick took his life. He didn't, because mm -hmm. his illness took it. It was no different. Patrick's passing was no different than had he gotten hit by a bus. Patrick, that week, the night before, or two days before, he had made himself two doctor's appointments for the coming, because he knew that something was going awry in his brain. And he, and he even said to me at one point, I'm saying this, I don't mean mom, I'm not sure why. Of course, that's difficult. You know, for me to look back and say, well, then why didn't I react more? Um, I, I just, again, didn't understand the depth of it by any stretch of imagination. Um, but I do know that um, Patrick loved living and he desperately wanted to live. And he was, if anything, he already was a little bit of a hypochondriac. <laughs> He was, took meticulous care of his body and, and his teeth. He hated cavities. He lost three times a day. And yeah. Just a silly, I mean, he was a little OCD for sure, a little but definitely compulsive about some things. Um, but one thing people don't know about Patrick is Patrick had a very serious heart ailment. Um, he had some, something called Epstein's anomaly, which um, was on one of his ventricles was um, disfigured and it was at some point going to have, to have to, a valve replaced. And I, because I always went to those appointments with him, um, one appointment, the doctor found a hole in the heart as well. And I, I'll never forget you know, Patrick's like that, that deep fear because he loved life. And he, you know, in his own silly way, asked the doctor if he was going to fuck it. But he was, he, he said it, you know, in an amusing, like, because that's how he dealt with it. But Patrick wanted to live one point he did not want to die he desperately desperately wanted to live and worked really hard um, and courageously fought this battle that ultimately took him I, th I think that's an amazing point to make um christine in terms of uh you know that's information in terms of him making appointments um for that week uh to see the doctor you know you can see his rational brain was was understanding he needed to, yeah. you know, make decisions to help himself live, you know, and um, it was the illness and, you know, it might have just been one panic attack that ultimately changed the course. Um, but, you know, that that's a really great point to make that Pat, Pat was, you know, in, in rational, you know, brain normal life was fighting was strong was, wanted to live um and it was the illness and and even i think i shared with you i know um i was the last person to talk to patrick um we were in washington dc and we were about to board a plane to come home and he um asked me if it would be okay if he started to commute because he was home. he was home he was here yeah. in seekonk and he was having he said, oh, mom, I'm really having a lot of the panic attacks again. And But he said, um, I, I don't want to miss any of the lag rehearsals. Um, he had talked about a solo that he might be doing. Um, so within hours of this happening, he had an entire plan for the next morning. That he could be asking us, you know, would it be okay if he used the car? He was very, very um, sensitive to ever like you know, posing on anything, you know, to, to a fault sometimes, you know, would that be a hardship if you used our car? And of course we were like, oh no, no by all means. Um, but that that's just how quickly it happened. Um, and one of my doctors, because I've had to see um, doctors for 
PTSD that I've suffered on from that night. And she said to me that it's it was entirely unpredictable. We couldn't have predicted it, and neither Patrick. Yeah. And that was helpful for me to hear because everyone that lives this, of course, blames themselves on some level. So many people, like people I never knew, have blamed themselves. Um, and I think that that was really helpful to, to have said it was that unpredictable, even to Patrick. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, you let me know where you want to go. I mean, we is if there's anything else that you want to say or if you want to talk about, um, you know, afterwards, you know, uh, in finding out or, um, you know, whatever, whatever you guys feel comfortable kind of talking about. Well, I think uh, it's kind of like a lot of different, like going back to sort of what, about Patrick, what, what Patrick, what, what people maybe that were friends of his, uh, or maybe people who are, who are going through, uh, Chris and I are not psychologists, not experts, and still there's so many questions, but there, it's, it's not without, it's not, it's not without hope. <clears throat> there's, there's hope. There's, there's, um, I think the lesson is to, as you've already stated, to reach out. Don't feel, um, whether the, you know, male or female, young know, man or woman, don't, don't, don't feel embarrassed by it. If you have to, if it means taking some time off from school, if it means they can take a time out from, from the general <clears throat> pattern of life that, that what we consider maybe normal or whatever, you're not going to graduate on time. Or, you, you know, you're not, you're not going to, it's okay. That's okay. Just you know, do what you need to do to take care of yourself. And, and, um, and if, and again, as a friend of that person, you know, just, just maybe keep an eye on that person. Just, you know, just, it, you, you guys already were doing that, but just be a good, good listener and maybe recommend that the person maybe, maybe think, think about some other things and think about taking that, that, that time out. Like a, it's almost like a pause, you know, just take a pause. Like Patrick kept <clears throat> wanting to go back, you know, go back and finish on time. And, and, uh, and he, again, was courageous about it. And, and I, that's one thing I think, you know, I think it, it's okay to just slow down, take a time out, uh, Take take a step back. Get get the, all the help you need. Whether, even if it means, honestly, even if it means a, a, a few visits in, to, to a to a hospital. Even if it means just to take a time out. You know, get get reset. Um, you know, it's it's, it's okay. That's that's okay. That's, that's that's it's okay to do that. It's not. You're not abnormal. You're you're not. People are not going to look at you. As a matter of fact, I think people will actually respect respect you for for being able to be to do that. It's, and I know. I think that's I think that's a difficult step. I know for myself, like it's, it's difficult to admit if something's bothering me, or um, and even more so like psychologically than physically. I'm actually pretty good at my stuff. My tell everybody knows about it. But but um, you know, it's the the times if you're down like that, just don't don't. You don't have to keep that to yourself. You can there are people you can share that with, and so that's you know that that I just that kind of wanted to put say that about those times that we've been talking about with Patrick being anxious. Yeah, you know, I, if I can add to that, I think uh, you know uh, three three months difference or. Um, you know, graduating a semester later, you know, at the time, it might feel like a huge deal or people would, you know, judge you for not um, being on time or whatever. But uh, at the end of the day, you have to take care of yourself first, you know, and your timing is your timing. And, you know, three months later or four months later, or a year later, like it, it, it everybody that supports and loves you will continue to support and love you. And as you said, John, like they, they'll respect you because a lot of us don't give ourselves that grace to, you know, take a break when we need it. And um, so there's a lot of respect that you'll, you'll gain from others because of the decision you're making. Um, you know, that's, that's a great piece of advice. 
So we continue to be grateful for Patrick. I mean, uh, um, extremely grateful for for his life and the outpouring and of uh, from his from very close to the time when he died till till today, three years. Um, it's been incredible and those things are is our faith number one that that honestly the cat carries us. There is no there's no doubt about that 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 has been our that's how we that's how we get through it. We we have total trust in God and his plan. Um, and we see so many things. Obviously this this was um, not what anybody would have wanted. And we see what has happened afterwards and the uh, the lives that he has touched. Um, he continues. We 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 get we get signs all the time um, about uh, you know just how he's uh, you know that he's he's okay and, mm. and uh, our daughter's always saying yeah he's okay but we're all miserable <laughs> <laughs> yeah but um not, not to make light of that but she says yeah that's, that's so our faith is paramount our trust is paramount we walk we walk by faith I I used to like look at someone that suffered what we've suffered and just say, how, how do you survive? And now I'm, I became that person. And first of all, you just, that's all you try to do is survive day at a time. You just literally, you, you fake it, you do whatever you can to just put one foot in front of the other. And it was only through the grace of God and friends and family and prayer that we began to live again. Because we knew for Patrick's sake, we had to do more than just survive. We had to find a way to live. Um, we owed it to the people that loved us, we owed it most especially to our children. We owed it to God and we owed it to Patrick. And so we vowed, and it's hard work, um, but we vowed to do that. And it's gotten easier, but it never gets easy. Um, we're coming into his anniversary in you know, a few weeks, and it's just you know we still have some really really hard days that are you know they they say the waves at first are like you know tidal waves and they come every ten seconds and then they the waves get a little smaller and they don't come as frequently and so that you, you have some peace in between and and we do we have a lot of time where we have peace in between um, but it will always. You know, you change forever. It leaves a hole in your heart. Um, you know, until I see him again, it motivates me to <laughs> get to heaven so I will see him again. Um, but, yeah. I again, the fact that you, you connecting with us and you grateful living podcasts and, and you're, what you're doing speaks absolutely to that it absolutely speaks to everything we're talking about another way that he has you know touched your life and you have reached out and touched so many other lives and that we're grateful it's, it's the key it's the we have to be grateful for the thing that you could you could you can hang on to a lot of anger blame yourself whatever all of that it, it, it's gratitude that is the weapon against all of that and it's the answer and so it's so it's so encouraging to have if you have to have reached out to us and see that you're actually spending your life great grateful living and doing it. And that hits the nail right on the head absolutely thank you, thank you. um you know uh, unfortunately there might be some parents who have recently lost a child listening to this um you know, is there something that you would tell them, you know, that you would have told your, you know, 2019 self now, knowing um, what you've been through um, in terms of the journey? You mean uh, after Patrick passed? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for the parents out there. Yeah. If um, they've recently I, lost a child. I, I think that what allowed us to um, to con to find life again was allowing people to share this with us and carry this cross. It was too heavy to carry alone, and I think we recognize that. 
from day one that was too heavy. And there are people, in our case, there were so many people that chose to be our Simon to help us carry this cross. And I think allowing that, um, because sometimes with grief, you can cling to it and we'll be greedy with it. This is my grief. How dare you compete with me? And um, I think that we found by sharing that and allowing those that so desperately wanted to take some of this on, allowing them to was that way of treading water, because that's all you're doing, is trying to tread water. And it just, it keeps you from sinking. And yeah. um, in, our, in our faith, you know, just the, we go into, we went to mass, you know, almost daily, um, there were hundreds of masses, like said for Patrick. We went to just as many as we could. I have a girlfriend who did a spreadsheet for me so I could keep track of them and go to anyone that I could go to. And that, that's where I found my hope. And that's where I just, I got my strength. It's received my strength. You, but it's not know, easy. Yeah. And to any parent who might be thinking, well, I don't feel that way. That's okay. That's okay. Everyone's journey is different. And I would never tell someone to, this is what you should do. This is how you should feel. No more than I wanted anyone to tell me that. I needed to find my way. And John, we need to find it together as a couple. We need to find it as mothers and father to our two other children. Um, we experience all of each other's grief. It's a very um, long, in-depth, complicated journey. However, it can also be as crazy as that can sound. Heavily on the Blessed Mother, heavily on the Blessed Mother and in her intercession and our prayer life and, um, you know, just going to her for comfort and, um, just, you know, we know that she lost her son and, and it, it has brought us a, some understanding of, of, of that, that the, the sorrow that she suffered and that she understands our suffering and all suffering. I'd have done the Blessed Mother and Anna more with Chris. It's, each is individual. There's really no one way that uh, everyone's, everyone's loss um, is different. It's, it's, it's unique. And, um, and it's, but, you know, we did, we did come to the, you know, sometimes I think people might get angry and hang on to anger and, and that we've, we honestly, you know, did not allow anger to be part of it. On the, you know, and or you know, I think you can also get angry at others if they didn't understand. Um, but it's people only want to help. Um, people want to be there. I think you, you know, if you feel those things, like you feel that a little bit, like well, you didn't lose that kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's understandable. Yeah, you're gonna have those feelings. But in terms of letting that settle in, you know, that's that's the stuff that we would try to you know uh, work at not hanging on to you know? yeah yeah there's there'll be people listening to this that know you um you know maybe they see you at the grocery store or something like that do you do you like to can you answer the question about whether you like to speak about pat there's nothing we'd like to talk <laughs> about more yeah, <laughs> well the, the hard thing is when other people won't allow us to because they yeah change the subject or they see me coming around the corner and they go the other way. <laughs> but that's okay. That's not yeah, all that. Yeah. Uh, quite honestly, yeah, in terms of like a public, we haven't done anything um, like this. We, this haven't, we haven't done a, a public um, whatever. Sharing. Know, share, yeah, there you go. Share, I'm looking for the right word. Sharing. Um, obviously, a lot of sharing with, you know, family members, friends and, um, you know, Counseling. I, lag know. does the lag does the service every year. Oh my gosh! Yeah, so incredible. Mm -hmm. So, incredible. so yeah. and then you know, unfortunately, we haven't been able to to do um to be there to be be there. You know, with with COVID, it's like you know, we're like, oh no, we want to see you guys and, and get the. Oh no, again, Meyer, incredible. Um, you know, like so many people have gone to college and Father McNellis and Father Pacelli, and we've had like. They've had us for a private mass for Patrick and things like that. It's just been the outpouring. It's just wonderful. Such a blessing. Such a blessing. So yeah, no, we love to 
share about share about after. I shared with Arna um, prior to this that um, my children have become very involved in an organization called NAMI, um, National Alliance for Mental Illness, mm -hmm. and um, started with my daughter Rachel. Um, just in a simple going for uh, one of those yeah. fundraising walks and then followed by my son Johnny using his gifts running to raise um, funds. And I knew that I was called, I know the Lord's calling me in some way to help another mother, a father, another sibling, but I just didn't know where, I just didn't want to fundraise, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, and Father McNellis actually said to me, Rachel, you're asked, and you're the first person to ask. Wow. Well. Um, well, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of people that are watching this are of the Catholic faith or maybe of some other faith. Um, uh, I'm really interested, you know, the, the fact that you never had anger towards God. Um, can you, it, okay. Okay. But, but it was, it was short lived. Okay. <laughs> Can can you t can you just talk about just that journey with your faith? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think um, I'll just for maybe, maybe we answer that separately. I don't know, but um, uh, of course, I, when this when this initially happens, it just throws you into wow, you know, like what is what's it all about? What how could this be? Honestly, that just a, how could this possibly be real? And it is whole segment of not even believing the reality of it. There are many days you wake up, many, many, and you thought it was an right. yeah. It's yeah. very hard to really, long time to, to know it was, it actually happened. Mm. So then, um, and then, you know, you, you, I think at, at some point you, you do have a choice to say, well, and then I'm not blaming anyone that, that I'm sure people have left and then maybe for a couple of years or maybe not did back or whatever for, for me for us it's it was the only place to turn it was the, the, the primary place to turn and we were blessed to have several uh, um, priest friends in our lives that we, um, we had over the years and, and again you, you see the purpose of why it, when you look back uh, i mean for anyone that i mean patrick had 14 priests at his funeral um and you know, there's we had so you know a lot of speaking with them and 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 uh, leaning on them for their spiritual uh, guidance, um, and just a total understanding, a total understanding that nobody expected us to, to just like right away go, oh yeah, it's, it's it, you know God meant for this to happen. You know what I mean? Um, so we've you know at the same time there's for us it's 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 everything. It's it's the it's how we have the realization that we're on to a journey for eternity. And this is, this is, this is the, the I, I call it the vestibule for eternity, eternal life. And so much grateful to be doing here. This is the ultimate resting place for any of us. Mm -hmm. Shortly after, or not shortly after Patrick died, a psychologist actually said him to John that he will be very angry will be very, and those points of anger will really be because we're angry at Patrick. And I was very confused by that. And I still am that he said that to me because I, it goes back to Patrick didn't take his life. And why would, if Patrick had died of cancer, would I have been angry at him? Of course not. Mm. Of course not. I, I knew that Patrick did everything he could to, to live. And um, <laughs> no, that I mean that that's an amazing point too in terms of the guilt portion, which I'm sure you know friends of his have told you, or you know like family is is separating that as you know the disease, um, you know versus him. Right, and know. the irony of of. Like from the night that we found Patrick um, to his funeral, our house probably had several hundred people here throughout that week. It was most days there were 50 people here inside the house, outside the house. 
we had the most greatest contrast of, as one priest said, we stepped into hell when we found Patrick. We stepped into hell. The greatest horrific moment any parent could ever experience contrasted with the greatest amount of love anyone could ever have experienced. And I felt like there was very no room, there was no anger in between the two, mm-hmm. quite honestly. Mm-hmm. There, there was tremendous fear because grief isn't just sad, it's terrifying. You don't want to go to sleep and you don't want to wake up. You want to go to, you go to sleep and you hope wake up in the morning it was a dream and you're petrified to go to sleep. You have to wake up again and live again. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I mean, I can honestly say we didn't have anger. It was just, and, and that was just grace. That was the grace of God, truth, and prayer that allowed us to um, accept this cross, know that God chose us for some reason. We don't know why. He didn't cause it, but he permitted it. And so we have to find a way um, to not only celebrate Patrick's life, but celebrate you know, um, everything about him. Um, and, and not celebrate is not the right word, but to use um, his illness for the benefit of others. Yeah, no, and, and we talked about this, um, you know, on our call, Christine, but, you know, going to his wake uh, was incredible because I, I don't remember, but maybe the hours like were five to nine and they extended it to like midnight or, and I mean, the line, I mean, I might have like, people waited at, you know, two hours. Um, I mean, it, it was incredible to see the love he had from Seekonk, BC, you know, all, all these people gathering bands to, you know, come down here um, to Rhode Island. And um, it, it was quite the scene. Just, I, I think, I think you told me that someone tweeted out who's the celebrity that passed or something like that, you know, and that's that, I mean, that, that was really apt way of, of putting, you know, how, how many people Pat yeah. impacted. Yeah. The blessing. The blessing. You know, quite honestly, too, just to relate stories that maybe other people who have gone through this or have lost a child in another way or have um, lost a Whatever parent lost somebody in their life, there you know, don't be surprised that there may be there may be a couple of people who um how do you say to surprise you in not being there anymore. And then but then conversely, more more uh to focus on some people who maybe you didn't imagine ever have have just been so there. So just don't, I'm just throwing that out like to not be surprised by by that or or angered by it either like or to, but just more joyfully accepting um, joyfully accepting those who had perhaps still to still reach out yeah um, you know i I think maybe um, you know for for you guys um and for people that didn't know him um can can you tell us like your favorite you know i'm sure there are many but your favorite story of patrick and kind of just you know if there's something that someone's listening to this who hasn't met him um you know what's a story that they can use to kind of um keep his spirit and and put it into their life there were just too many. <laughs> yeah. just, yeah. just, honestly, from infancy through toddler years, through it's just the most hilarious person I've ever known. There's not even a close second. <laughs> he, was, he was just fun. And you know, he did Patrick was Victorian school, so he he did his his um he, he prepared his talk, and it always has to be approved by the by the teachers um, before that. And then he they didn't approve it because it wasn't anything like 
bad, but it wasn't really of the vein that maybe a normal one would go. Yeah. And he said, and in that day, he said, you know what, I'm doing it. And he, it was hilarious. He was talking about my mother. Not, not, not. He mentioned everything you're not supposed to talk about. Yeah. Politics. Yeah. He did. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone loved it. Yeah. Patrick, as you know, was very unfiltered. So yeah. it made for a very yeah. comical He's scene. Very, uh, you know, just, and then I then you heard some just very, you know, just funny stories at school. That, that he, he was just never afraid to ask questions at other, you know, I think it was, I think it was Dr. Kreft's class that nobody, everyone was intimidated not to ask. And then Patrick was, he had the hand up and they were like, oh my gosh, Patrick's going to ask a question, you know, just, or whatever. He, he was not, a, uh, I don't know, he just, he was always, he just felt it important to be yourself. And if you, if you had something to say, you know, maybe sometimes it wasn't anything bad, but again, he was unfiltered. And, um, and I don't know if anybody knew, I mean, this again, you could go on forever, but Patrick played the tuba in high school and, and then, you know, he was not as, you know, there would be some times when it'd be in the evening and John, our son would have some friends over or my daughter would have some friends over and Patrick would come down, you know, with the tuba, doing like modern songs on the tuba, like if you can imagine that, and dancing <laughs> around, but, you know, just yeah, stuff like that. He just was always, uh, <clears throat> he, he, he had a way of, uh, of, of gathering a crowd around him, telling some stories and stuff. But yeah. That way I did. Yeah, you know, if 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 we do a, another, we could almost do another podcast. We'll give some time, and we'll do the we could do the Patrick stuff. <laughs> yeah, 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 hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, uh, Christine and John, we, we've talked about a good amount. Um, is, is there anything else that you would like to, you know, kind of pass on to anybody listening out there? I mean, there's obviously di various different angles, but um, as you look back on this on this journey um you know in, in the realm of just helping other people or making more people uh aware or any any vein um that that you want to just pass on or have people kind of think about or reflect on i would just say if there's anything that we said and anyone wanted to reach out to us and talk to us further whether it be a parent whether it be someone struggling themselves um, to I don't know how we do that or email yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. Um, to feel most comfortable to do that because we don't know who is listening or will listen to this um, and I think we did cover a lot um, and what what might have spoken to someone that maybe said oh I wish they had elaborated or I have a question you know, about that but again our our sole purpose in doing this is is to prevent another family from this tragedy. Um, and just to let any young person or old person, whoever, know that they are not alone and there is help. There's help, you know, medications, that, that's another thing we didn't go into, but I think that there were other probably better choices that we could have made, didn't know, um, and help in terms of, you know, um, just diagnosing. You know, I, I think we need to do better in terms of asking the right questions, really reaching out to the people around the person, not the person itself, but the caretakers, the friends around them to um, help determine what the best treatment for us. And, and, and first of all, what, what exactly are we even dealing with? Yeah, no, that's great. And I would go back to repeating uh, something that we talked about earlier in that, Again, you know, a lot of times societal norms have us graduating in four years or I don't know, whatever. That's just a, coming up. But it, just going back to the fact that it's okay to take a pause, to do what you need to do, to take care of yourself. And your friends, your friends are be there. Those those friends who are true friends, and if they're not, then those really weren't. Anything or a parent going through it. It's okay if your child um, is not whatever, a student or the child doesn't finish college or doesn't fi finish high school on time, whatever, it's okay. Just, it, it, you know, just, um, you know, don't, don't feel um, uh, embarrassed by that or in any way, shape or form that there's any kind of judgment on it. Um, it's better to get, get the help that you need and in the long term, looking back, you'll be glad. Yeah, 
uh, do you guys want to say what the best way to reach out to you, to you guys is? Um, probably our email. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, Mine is my name. Okay. Well, you, I know, but you have her email. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can, I'll put it in the show notes. So you can put it in the chat. Yeah. 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 You're talking now. You're getting way beyond our our abilities technically here, Anna. You're gonna. Have to, <laughs> you can put that in the in the chat or whatever. Think yeah. that people would. Uh, I'm sure you have a way of. Yeah, I'll put it in the show notes. That's um, fine. That's yeah, fine. and yeah, I, yeah. I, and I don't want to speak for you guys, but you know, I, I think, um, one of the reasons it took me a while to reach out was because I didn't know what your response would be, and like, but, you know, Christine, you said to me like, um, no, like we love talking about Pat, and so don't be afraid to reach out. We love hearing the stories that we might, you know, might not have known or things like that, and just having um you know that was one reason i was so afraid because i wasn't sure how it'd be interpreted but you were like no it, it it's nice to be able to talk about him and yeah. speak to someone who loved him again so i think yeah, yeah. um yeah. from my perspective just not being afraid you know i know a lot of of his loved ones uh friends and family um might be listening and you know i encourage you to reach out to to Christine or John because it was it was really enjoyable um being able to to talk uh about him um it's been a blessing to get to know you everything's in God's time if you said you didn't yeah that's fine that's good I'm glad you I'm glad you did yeah. uh it's okay it's it's and it, it's all it's all good it's all in, in in his time and and it's meant it's all meant to be for the for us and so we're just so absolutely grateful that you did reach out to us. And thank you for allowing us to yeah. talk about him and yeah, to, in any way, if they help another person, it, um, thank you for allowing us to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, as I, as I conclude, I, I just want to say to the, you know, people listening, you know, I think we have a, a tendency as, as people to romanticize the people that have passed on, but that was truly, you know, for anyone that interacted with them, you know, uh, there's probably not a soul that, that could say that they hated him. Um, and I, I just, he, he was a light. He provided so much laughter. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I want to say to Pat, thank you for, for your impact on all of us. Um, you know, there's a reason, you know, for the way, you know, the visiting hours had to be extended three hours or whatever it was, you know, um, that was just the type of person he was. And, um, you know, to anybody out there um, struggling, you know, I think it's okay to get help. I think it's it's okay to, um, you know, as John said, take breaks, um, do, do what's necessary for you to um, take care of yourself. Um, you know, for, for people uh, uh, that are our friends or families and are seeing someone, you know, provide your best support, um, that you can. And, um, you know, that's all you can ask from yourself. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 I thank, I thank you guys, Christine and John for, for coming on. Um, this was, this was great. And, uh, you know, hey. Pat spirit continues to touch people, uh, with, with, all the people that listen here. Yep. Yeah. Stay in touch. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Arnav.